Thank you very, very much. Uh, greetings from Colorado. I mean, I can see you. I don't know. Oh, I can see you waving back. Awesome. So I, I know you can hear me well. It's a delight to be with you. I would uh, thank Carol and Hannah for giving time, but they're all asleep. It's early out here in Colorado. Uh, and uh, I got up, you know, plenty early to want to be here with you. I want to share my screen. I'm assuming that that's going to work out okay here. Uh, can you see this all right? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and push this up here. Uh, so disciple making into the future is kind of what I've been asked uh, to talk about. And uh, as uh, was said, uh, there's kind of a disciple making operating system that's been developed over the last 10 years. And uh, oh, wait, a before I get all serious about disciple making, got to share one thing with you. That's my view right now. So, uh, you know, be jealous. That's that's it. But don't be jealous of the bill that I've got to put out this this week because it's a really, really, really big one. Uh, my daughter's a photographer and just loves the scenery. So if you look way down here, I don't know if you can see my arrow or not. There's a little uh, T uh, down here and the wedding is actually going to be there with all those mountains in the background. So we're real excited. I am absolutely beside myself with joy. Uh, she's marrying one of the coolest guys from one of the coolest families. The Phipps family could not be happier right now. And it's a joy to be with you because uh, this wasn't mentioned, but my wife uh, is a prime and her mother's name is Heisinger. So uh, they were part of the CRC uh, forever and forever and ever from up in Chicago. Uh, he was on the south side of Chicago and she was from up, she went to Calvin. So we've got Dutch, like our kids are 50% Dutch and 50% everything else. So glad to be with you this morning. Let's talk about disciple making. Uh, this is a system that uh, came to be uh, after 15 years of ordained ministry, as was mentioned, I uh, have been a pastor for 25 years, now 26. And the first 15 years, uh, I was working hard, but extraordinarily dissatisfied with the results of the maturity I saw in people. And uh, that broke my heart and I didn't know how to fix it. I worked harder. Uh, I worked as smart as I could. Um, and then 2010, so just about 11 years ago, I was at Westside Family Church in Kansas City, a big church, about 5,000 people. And we had just doubled our small groups ministry. I was a small groups guy. It was about 120 groups when I got there. And with this first initiative we did a year in, we had just doubled the groups to about 240. We had just added about 1,000 people to groups. And I remember being on the way home from my first group experience. And um, Jesus kind of joined me in the car. And his his message to me, and I don't have these super intense moments often, uh, but this one was pretty super intense. He, he basically looked at me and he said, Brian, you keep taking this multiplication symbol I give you and kind of twisting it back into an addition symbol. And you're happy about it. Um, and he's like, there's so much more. There's so much more. If you would just take your eye off of the game that you think you're playing right now and shelve it for me and just obey me for a little while, um, then I'll show you every step to take. And it was, it was my exodus, in a, in a sense, out of this drudgery type of work of just working hard with brick and straw and, and doing the absolute best that I could you know, uh, to this place where there was some real flourishing happening that I had never, ever, ever seen before. So uh, basically, this is an invitation to tap into that journey. Um, and I'm getting ready to share really is just the culmination of 10 uh, years of effort. So I hope it's meaningful and helpful to you. We, if we want to lead like Jesus, here's what I found out. We have to start using Jesus' question when it comes to making uh, disciples. Now, typically our question is, what are you studying? When it comes to small groups, the number one question people wanna know the answer to before joining your group is what do you study? <laughs> and you know, the second question, it's uh, do you have childcare? You know, I mean, if you got a, a church of young families, that's what they wanna know. And I don't know if it's the same with Sunday school systems. It's been a long time since I've been a part of that. So if you have a Sunday school system, uh, it might be more relational, but. Uh, more a relationship question or an age question or something like that. But primarily it's, what are you studying? And we need to start using Jesus question. You know, how will I be different? How will I be transformed? 
What's going to be different about my life? Peter was a fisherman uh, who probably was doing pretty well up in Capernaum. And uh, Jesus said, no, we're going to go and we're going to become fishers. And how, how will my life be different? And I want to introduce a concept here from John 8, 32. You can see the verse there. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. The point there isn't the truth. The point there is freedom. He wanted his people to be free. And he realized that, that the truth, he, the truth, and the, the, the written word that we find in scriptures, truth, are the means to an end for you to be set free. And uh, somebody type in there if it gets loud. I've got uh, noise canceling headphones on. It seems as if they just started to run something. And if they have, I will have to go outside. Uh, so just text and let me know if for whatever reason uh, the volume gets it gets fat. So you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. One of the things I love about Reformed congregations and Reformed theology, of which I'm a huge advocate, I went to Reformed Theological Seminary myself, uh, is the commitment to truth. But the problem is there are times when we can make truth more of the end than the means to the end. Like we know the truth. We've got the truth. But wisdom ultimately uh, is something that builds us up, that changes us. Uh, truth uh, alone uh, can just puff us up. And that's not what we want. We don't want to be, you know, hot air balloons filled with, with truth and even accurate truth. We want to be people that take advantage of what it has to say. And in, in John chapter 17, there's another example of, of Jesus talking about this. He's praying for the disciples when he says, your word is truth and sanctify them by your truth. The process or the goal there the pericope, if you will, was sanctification, not truth. Truth is absolutely essential to get to that sanctification, but the sanctification was the, was the focus of Jesus' prayer. And so we have to lead out with Jesus' question if we want to start making disciples. How will I be different after this experience? You know, uh, Dave Ramsey tells us how people are going to be different when they take Financial Peace University. He's going to say, uh, you're going to have a, a budget that's going to work. You're going to have a month of savings already saved up by the end of this. He gives them measurable and attainable goals that they'll have you know, in place by the end of the time. And I love that focus on that. So use Jesus' question. We also have to use Jesus' invitation. I'll be quick on this. <laughs> this, is a, this is a question of tone. Uh, Jesus said these words in John 10, 10, the thief has only come to steal, kill, and destroy. Let me ask you a question real quick. Have you seen the thief's work of late? I mean, have you seen what he's accomplishing in the world? Like he's doing a killer job if his job is just to continually steal, kill, and destroy. I can't stand it, but it's true. Jesus puts a big butt on there. He says, he says, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. I don't know about you, but I'm seeing tons of people paying tons of money for medicine and extra help. And, and I got a counseling degree. I'm not against any of those things, but people are searching for life and not find it. Jesus is saying, I have it and I want to pass it on to you. And But when it comes to disciple making, we're not leading with that kind of posture like this is gold. <laughs> we kind of have this posture like it's behavior management or a behavior modification system that is keeping, you know, that, that wants to kind of suck life away from people instead of bring life to people. It just seems to me that, you know, if Jesus himself uh, had people knocking down the door, you know, to get to him to where uh, they had, actually some people had to crawl in through the roof, you know, to get to Jesus. Why is it that we don't have flocks of people lining up uh, to to taste and to see that which uh, our forefathers thought was really, really good uh, to taste and see? We got to start with the question, how will we be different? Uh, but But to really start to make the the question become relevant. We have to start leading with Jesus' invitation. It's life to the full. It's not a behavior modification process. It's a life. It's an invitation to experience life to the full. So to deliver on the invitation, we have to focus on very specific outcomes, very specific outcomes. And I want to make sure that that's not loud. I am sorry. Uh, I don't see anybody typing anything, so I guess we're okay. Please type if it does get loud, as I can't tell otherwise. Oops, sorry. We have to, uh, if we want to uh, deliver on this invitation, we have to focus on some outcomes. I'm sure that all of you have heard about SMART goals. 
SMART goals. Uh, they're specific, they're measurable, they're attainable, they're relevant, and they're timely. And SMART goals is a term used in business because we actually want to know where we are and whether or not we're making progress. It would be great for us to, to have some type of uh, agreed upon uh, definition of what it means to be a disciple and, uh, and then to actually measure whether or not we're making them so that we can see how well we're doing so that if we're not doing well, we can make adjustments in order to accomplish this thing called making disciples. And so uh, what Jesus taught me when I first, when I, back in 2010, when I just said, okay, I'll shelve everything I thought I'd do about disciple making. And I'll just listen. The first thing he said to do was, hey, why don't you just do a quick review of theology proper? And you, you're familiar with theology proper. It's a study, you know, of the Godhead. And I was like, that's, a, that's an odd thing to study, uh, knowing that I'm asking a disciple making question. Uh, but he was, he was firm on it. And so I was like, okay, the father ordained our salvation. So he's a part of this gig. Uh, the son accomplished our salvation. He's definitely uh, worthy of praise because of that. But it's the spirit who applies that sanctification that applies that salvation. We call it sanctification or we call it discipleship or disciple making or becoming more like Christ sharing in his identity. So it's the spirit who does that. It's not the father or the son. They played their role, but it's the spirit who is active in us uh, to, to bring about that transformation that we're talking about. Like, how will I be different? Well, the spirit tells us how we'll be different. And you can see it here, just glaring on the screen, the fruit of the spirit. And right there is your measurements. You want to know how things are going with your spiritual formation? Let's ask some questions. How loving am I? How joyful is my life? How peaceful, patient, not when I'm at work around the people that I have to be a professional in front of, uh, but in front of the, the spouse or the kids uh, or the coworkers when things are really stressful. These are the measurables of the way the spirit of God wants to transform us. And you can see this list in a couple of different places, like in second Peter, add to your faith, goodness, and to goodness, self-control and things like that. Our word for that is character. So you see that down at the bottom. The other way, that the spirit of God changes us it isn't fruit of the spirit. It's gifts of the spirit. If character is who we're becoming, the gifts is what we're doing. We teach, we lead, we show mercy, we heal, we have show compassion. Uh, we teach, we administrate, whatever those gifts are. Uh, God has given all of us a gift from this great variety of gifts. You've them well uh, to serve one another. And so the, our definition of a disciple is seen down there at the bottom. It's a person who's growing in character and calling. And what will happen as they grow in character and calling, those are our two relentless focuses. If we grow in character and calling, those actually multiply each other and have an impact on the inside of us and then have an impact through us out into the world. And this is the key to mobilizing people. This is the key to getting them off out of the bleachers down onto the field to start playing the game with us. And uh, man, all of us are tired of the 80-20 or the 90-10 rule, whatever it is in your church, and we're tired of it. And we started to see people uh, see themselves as partners with us instead of people that were just sheep that were dependent upon us. And I think that's what we want more than anything else. So here, I sent you smart goals. These are some actual statistics of people uh, who uh, come in to one of our experiences. We've got a few experiences, followers made, leaders made. These are all kind of high impact, uh, high, high, you know, high bar kind of experiences that we've created. And um, the average reporting of character and calling, you can see that, that the character is nothing but a listing of the fruit of the spirit. And they give the answer, six for loving and five joyful. Peace, we're going down. Patience usually grabs most people. Um, and you can see that's a 4.8 out of 5, now, or I'm sorry, 4.8 out of 10. Very subjective, very subjective, but it, we want to establish a baseline. Over here on calling, you can see that the score is a 1.6 out of 10, which is abysmal. And I think it's because we haven't done the training. Uh, perhaps we haven't even done much teaching when it comes uh, to calling. I didn't get equipped in seminary to do this at Reform Seminary in Orlando. Um, 
it was more about the, you know, being biblically responsible, theologically responsible. And uh, this element was not a piece of it. And, and if you look at it, if your definition of a disciple is a person who's developing character and calling in order to have an impact made in them uh, by Jesus and then through them uh, with Jesus into the world, uh, you can see that 7.7 .7 out of 100 stinks. I mean, put your hand up if you think that stinks. Let me see it because I got to I want to know that we're all connecting here. I got I see one hand, three hands. All right. I can't I can't see that. You're on a small picture. Now. I can't see real well. But I mean, here's what I believe. I believe people feel that gap. And I believe that every time they go hear another sermon or another Sunday school lesson or another small group uh, lesson or another whatever it is, the gap between who they are and who they know they should be and could be and want to be just gets bigger. And I believe that gap actually stunts our capacity to actually really step in to do something. Because if we did, we would probably be exposed for the faith that we know that we are. And I know I'm kind of speaking quickly and, and, uh, and strongly, but this is just what I found to be true. Now, how do we start to make a difference here? How do we start to level these uh, scores up? If we want to, we gotta, we've got to define, you know, that we're going to be going after those outcomes, character and calm. Jesus told me, character and calm. That's it. Don't, don't do anything else. Just focus on those two things. And I was like, well, content isn't going to be enough. I don't even have content. What do we have to add? We have to integrate the spiritual habits. These things aren't a source to, to check our legalism box. These are the calisthenics uh, to get into the gym of spiritual formation and do the exercises that are required to actually accomplish these outcomes. Uh, all of our experiences, like Brian said in his presentation before, um, get you immersed in scripture, in community, bathed in prayer, and soaked with accountability. And for Bible reading, we have Bible reading plans and all of our stuff. But the goal isn't just to read the scripture. It's to ask as you're going through the scripture, uh, you know, Jesus, what are you teaching me today from this particular passage? And, and what do you want me to do about it? And in our app, you actually type out those two statements. And then the people in the group, particularly the triad members in your group, we kind of subdivide our groups into triads. They actually see what you type every day as if like it's on its own little private uh, Jesus centered Facebook page. You know, that's our app. That's what it's like. And uh, they see the I will statements that you're making every day. The I believe and I will statements and they're supporting you. They're rallying you on. They're asking you how it went and they're praying with you as you pray uh, for Jesus to show the way. I'll give you one quick example of this. It was a number of years ago. The daughter that is getting married on Tuesday uh, she was still like 16 or so, and she's type A, and she can tell I probably am too. And um, we had escalated into a pretty significant fight. And uh, it was the ugliest one that we'd ever had. We both said things we regret, both went to bed really just distraught. And I got up the next morning, I'm doing faithful to my Bible reading and journaling, and I read that, that passage, you know, a general answer turns away wrath. <laughs> it's like, that's, I, 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 I hate me. And, uh, and Jesus helped me figure that out. But, you know, I read that passage, but I don't just read it. I read it to ask, what are you teaching me today? And that obvious what he's teaching me is that I blew it last night. And I knew that already. But the big key came when he said, uh, you know, what, what, when I asked, what do, you, what do you want me to do about it? What do you want me to do? And his answer to me was, I want you to apologize to Hannah without reminding her of any of her complicit nature in the event. That's hard. I like fair. And that wouldn't be fair. And Jesus said, was it fair with me? Said, no. So, okay, got it. And the second thing I want you to do is to tell her that if you ever start to escalate like that again, she can quote this verse to you. That was a very specific I will that I got because I know that there's guys that are going to read it. I know that I've bathed that moment in prayer. I know that's what he was teaching me. I typed it out. And my daughter and I, have never escalated since. More loving, more joyful. You see it? These are the gym, these are the callous, the spiritual calisthenics that actually accomplish character and calling. You can see all of the, uh, the habits you have to be a part of that are all woven into our stuff. You have to serve to get into one of our groups. You can't go calling and ask about their gifts and whether that that's their gifts or not if they're not serving somewhere. Uh, we have consistent peer feedback 
on whether or not you have the gifts that you think you have or whether you haven't identified the real gifts that you do have. Missionary rhythms, uh, the blessed rhythms, if you're familiar with that, begin in prayer, listen, eat, serve, and share are, is a great way to be a neighbor. Leadership development, I'm going to kick on. I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this that um, the content can't be the point. Content has to support the transformation, which is the point, but it can't become the focus. Most of our small groups and most of our Sunday schools are content focused. That's why we ask the question, what are you studying? We need excellent content and we have a plethora of content. We have a plethora of incredible content but we're choosing to make content king instead of content, the support of the transformation, which should be king. You can see in followers made, we, we pick uh, authors, uh, other people. This one's a book that I help participate in and writing uh, the product of God. We use other people's books because we want people to come through our experiences to curate their own libraries of the best thought leaders for followers. made, it's around developing a Christ centered identity in a Christ-centered worldview, gospel-centered worldview. And leaders, hey, we want people to learn how to lead and to become spiritual influencers of their own right, to get in the game with us and fight. And so if you took all of that, this is the operating system that was mentioned earlier. We call it the IDE, or the Intentional Disciple-Making Environment. If you don't write anything else down on this one, please write this one down, because whether you ever use Disciples Made's tools or not, you can use these ideas. We're outcome focused. You know the outcomes, their character and calling. We're relentless about developing those two things because we can make them smart goals. We can help people see whether or not they're making progress. Uh, they're habit fueled. It's the habits that bring about the outcomes, like I shared in the illustration with Hannah. It's not the content that gets the outcomes, it's actually the content without the habits uh, gets us to the point where <laughs> we're. We're so outpaced by what we know that our character can't catch up. And then content flavored. And what I mean by content flavored is the content should be determined by the spiritual formation need of the person at the time. I don't need an alpha course right now. I need more theology. I need more, you know, help me understand Jesus more and help me be more intimate with him. That's probably what I need now. I don't need something on the front end, but there are people on the front end. And we need to be able to provide content that's appropriate for their form of spiritual formation. You can add content focused or outcome focused. You can add habits incre incrementally into your small groups, into your Sunday schools, whatever it is. And the more your environments have the IDE flavor, the more you will actually see not just people becoming more alive in Christ, experiencing that John 10, 10, but you'll see more people mobilized who want to join you in ministry. Here's the scores. <clears throat> this is pretty fun. Followers made participants generally report a 60% increase in character and a 300% increase in calling, which is a 540% increase in spiritual impact. Now, I'm not sure, you know, how big of a deal these numbers mean to you. They're, they're significant. I got to see the stories and if I had time, I could share the stories, but I'll tell you this, at Westside, I had 11 guys go through that very first 12 month experience with me. And after that 12 months, um, I got them up on the stage in front of our leadership community and they told their stories and we had a line of people waiting for a 12 month experience that read through the whole Bible in a year that was just huge, huge impact. Um, and we never announced it from the platform. We never announced these things publicly. It was our commitment to just simply uh, raise up leaders and then get the people that were demanding it or the people that were volunteering in our ministries to accomplish it. So here's some questions. I hope this has been helpful and meaningful for you. If there's anything we can do at Disciples Made to serve you, that's what we wanna do. Thanks for the privilege.